My name is Yevna Knezhevich, and I am the Associate Director for the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, and am delighted on behalf of the Center to welcome you all today to our annual Dolan Lecture. The Alexander Dolan Lecture Series was founded in 1998 to, profess, uh, to honor Professor of History and Political Science, Alexander Dolan, who was a founder of uh, this center and director of CREES um, two times, um, from 1985 to 1989, and then again from 1992 to 1994. Uh, past Dolan lectures have included many noted scholars in the fields of Russian, East European, and Eurasian studies, uh, and today is no exception. Uh, and to introduce our speaker today, Elliot Bornstein, I will pass it over to Professor Gabriela Safran of uh, the Slavic Department. Um, after Professor Bornstein speaks, uh, I will come back uh, on camera to moderate the Q&A, and we invite you uh, to input any questions that you have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. So with that, let me pass it over to Professor Gabriela Safran. Hello and welcome. Uh, so our speaker today is Elliot Bornstein, a professor of Russian and Slavic studies and a collegiate pre professor at New York University. He's also a senior academic convener for the Global Network. Uh, Professor Borenstein has a BA from Oberlin and a PhD from the University of Wisconsin. He's been teaching at NYU since 1995. He is a very uh, kind of well-known and amazing figure in our field. He's an incredibly prolific writer, uh, has this really unique sense for the intersections among politics history and culture. And he brings these things together in his books with really amazing analysis and also a great sense of humor, which you don't always see in every uh, work of literary criticism. Um, his books include Men Without Women, Masculinity and Revolution in Russian Fiction, 1917 to 1929, um, Overkill, Sex, Violence, and Russian Popular Culture After 1991, and Pussy Riot, Speaking Punk to Power. Today, Professor Bornstein is going to talk about uh, the pervasive manifestations of conspiratorial and paranoid culture in present day Russia. Um, and his talk will be based on his most recent award winning book, Plots Against Russia conspiracy and fantasy after socialism. Among the awards that this book has won, I just want to point out is the 2020 Vucinich Prize, which is co-sponsored by the Association for Slavic, um, Slavic East European and Eurasian Studies and by uh, the Stanford University Center for Russian East European and Eurasian Studies, which is the, the unit that's putting on this talk today. Um, the so that prize is named after Wayne Vucinich, who with Alexander Dahlin was a founder of the Center for Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies at Stanford. So, so we feel like we, we have some claim on, on Elliot. He's, he's like in some way also ours and we're kind of welcoming him home um, as, as a winner of, of what we kind of think of at Stanford as like our prize. Um, so uh, this, this book, everyone I know has been talking about it. I can't wait to read it. I have it. I'm going to read it this summer as soon as the Stanford quarter ends. Um, yeah, let me just say, you know, the our, our lecturer today is just one of the most, you know, fascinating and productive and relevant and amusing people who writes about Russian literature today. And it's just a, priv a privilege and a pleasure to share a discipline with him and also to introduce him today. So let us welcome our speaker, Elliot Borenstein. Thank you, Gabriela. That was a, a really generous introduction and um, such a high bar that I'm sure I'm going to stumble over it during this talk. And um, I hadn't made the connection actually between the um, between the center and the award and this, so it's, I. I owe Stanford a lot, so thank you very, very much. Um, and thank you, Jovana and Mike, and thank you, um, Amir Weiner, for inviting me. Um, this is really uh, great, and I'm so happy to be here. I wish I could actually be there. I've always really enjoyed my visits to Stanford, but this one, I have to admit, has been um, 
a lot lower impact in terms of um, standing up in my office and actually just sort of giving a talk. So let me share a screen here. All right. Find the right window. Oh, okay. And uh, all right. So I am going to, I'm putting it in slideshow mode and I'm just pointing out that I have mixed results with the slideshow mode on Keynote and Zoom. Sometimes things go weird. So if there's a problem, if someone could let me know, that would be really great. Um, anyway, so again, um, thank you, everybody. I thought I'd say a few words about how this whole project came about before it's kind of giving an overview of what of what I see going on in conspiracy in, in, in Russia. Basically, this was the stuff I followed in the 1990s. I spent several years in Russia there um, and was fascinated by it. I was following generally um, everything going, everything I could going on in mass culture. And at the time, I didn't know I was going to write a book on popular culture. I kept doing articles. Someone asked if I was writing a book and I said, I guess I am. So I, I wrote a book um, and I was always attracted to conspiracy theories just in general. And there was so much going on in Russia with conspiracy theory that um, my second book, Overkill, um, ended at the time with a chapter called Plots Against Russia. Um, but uh, one of my editors, um, Bruce Grant, um, one of the wisest people I know, said, you know, it doesn't really fit so well, take it out. And um, then I had a talk to give for a while and I gave talks on conspiracy, taught a class and I give talks, someone would say, are you writing a book? And I said, I guess I am. Um, so I have a kind of slacker way of getting around to doing these things, but I'm, I'm, um, I'm glad someone asked me because I'm, I'm just so happy to have um, spent so much time working on all of this. So um, conspiracy theory um, is a topic that snuck up on me in terms of its relevancy. I thought it was relevant but marginal when I started and it got so relevant it was scary by the time that I was done. Um, and there's also a great deal of really good scholarship and not so good scholarship, a great deal of scholarship and a fair amount of really good scholarship out there um, on conspiracy theory. The one the, um, the approach that I like the most, even though I used it um, rather sparingly, um, is this whole idea that um, Michael Barkun, oh, that's my book, Michael Barkun comes up in his um, A Culture of Conspiracy, where he talks about the idea of the super conspiracy and how basically if conspiracy theories circulate um, long enough, they all kind of come together into one super conspiracy that um, contains everything, sort of like the plot of um, Foucault's Pendulum, if you read that. So you end up with this world in which the lizard people at the hollow earth are working at the behest of the Jews who are controlling the world on behalf of the um, aliens who are constantly doing anal probes on people and it's all one big story. Um, so that's all very attractive um, if, you, if you like that sort of thing and I do. Um, but as I was looking at it and I was looking at the, um, a lot of the scholarship on conspiracy and, and plots and the notion of um, the sort of coincidence between narrative form and um, the idea of a conspiratorial plot and the, also the, the primacy of uh, the human mind's tendency towards pattern recognition, right? I mean, it, it's very helpful for us to recognize patterns because if we recognize patterns, we can make conclusions. And a very common way of looking at conspiracy theory is it's the pattern recognition mechanism in our mind going into overdrive. Um, all of this stuff I found really useful, but then there are also a set of questions, which I don't believe I, can, I have successfully answered. I've only, um, only um, gone a little bit in that direction, but I think really fascinating about this um, is the question that comes to mind, I think of a lot of people who don't really think they believe in conspiracy theories, which is how can people believe this stuff? Um, this is the question I think a lot of people who are not you know, in the MAGA crowd right now in America are asking, how is it possible to, to, to believe this? Do people believe it? In the case of Russia, um, do people really believe what, um, what they hear on state television? Is there something pathological about this? Or is there something really, really normalizing? Are we, um, are, are we uh, pathologizing something that's really pretty standard? So um, with all this in mind, um, in the book, I set out to examine um, the ways in which conspiracy theory plays out um, in Russian culture. Um, and uh, by the way, there are now four books on conspiracy theory in Russia that uh, are either out or coming out. Um, and it's really fascinating to me that they all do different things. So um, the nice thing is if you don't get what you want from my book, there are plenty of other choices out there. Um, so one of the questions I asked myself um, in particular because of uh, uh, being in, um, really enamored with Michael Barkun's theory is, is conspiracy always a full-fledged full plot? I mean, do we always have to think of conspiracy as actually having a start to finish, a com completely um, all-encompassing narrative? Um, or is it possible that there, we could break it down into smaller parts? Um, I think narrative is nonetheless key here um, because narrative 
um, is what teaches us ultimately to con to trust conspiracy. If we consume, as we consume narrative, we um, develop conspiratorial habits of thinking, um, in part because a good narrative is one in which all everything kind of comes together. And part of the satisfaction of a good narrative can be seeing how everything comes together. So in my mind, I always have a, a, an example of what would make a really bad novel or a really bad movie. So let's say the novel starts out in kind of John Updike territory, but without all the sexism. John Updike territory, but in say, uh, New Jersey, right? It's in Summit, New Jersey, um, a married couple is, it's in the morning, a married couple's having a fight. They're always having fights, um, yelling about something to the kids or something. And um, there's this whole drama about whether or not their, their marriage is going to survive. The husband gets on the commuter train, goes into New York, goes into his office in the World Trade Center. The airplanes hit the uh, World Trade Center and he dies. Um, now, that is a terrible novel. That's a terrible ending to the novel because even though, as we know, this happened, unless we're really far into a conspiratorial um, uh, rabbit hole, um, even though this happened, and even though in fact, presumably something like I described probably did happen um, involving some of the people who died in 9-11, as a story, it's completely unsatisfying um, because unless we can work really hard to somehow connect this uh, the husband's death in 9-11 to everything else going on, it's coming out of left field. And we want things to work together. Um, narrative teaches us to um, not only to look for patterns, but also to accept the, um, to accept the unacceptable as part of generic conventions. Um, so another example I like to look back to, going back to the 1990s where this all started for me, um, is imagine you're watching TV um, and at eight o'clock you're watching the X-Files, um, and you're watching Mully, Muller, uh, sorry, Scully and Mulder chasing down possible aliens, uh, things with mind control, um, and while you're watching that, you can be really into it. Then at nine o'clock, you switch to Law and Order with um, a murder case ripped from the headlines. Um, and while you're watching, um, while you're watching X-Files, you were at least allowing for the possibility that there are aliens, that there are strange creatures out there. But if you're watching Law and Order and there's a corpse in the first couple minutes, which there always is, I always wonder why these people in the first couple minutes of Law and Order don't know they're about to find a corpse. Um, if you're watching Law and Order the first couple minutes, um, find the corpse and at the end of the hour, the solution is that aliens from outer space came down and killed the, 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 per, the uh, future corpse. Um, that is unsatisfying because you the laws of the genre will not allow it. And yet an hour ago, you could have accepted it. Um, so um, at eight o'clock we're Mulder and at nine o'clock we're Scully, but we're still the same people. Um, but, what the, but what this example show, or what I want this example to show is that um, you as a subject watching something or consuming narrative um, can be a different kind of subject for one, from one moment to another. And that um, as we consume narratives, we are all part-time conspiracy theorists. And that I think is an important thing because that um, depathologizes conspiracy theory to some extent. All of this goes back to um, the thinker who really, um, one of the people who really brought conspiracy theory um, to the mainstream as a topic dis of discussion, um, and that's Richard Hofstetter, um, author of The Paranoid St Style in American Politics, um, who of course coined that term, term the paranoid st style to talk about um, a way, a way of acting in a way of being that seems paranoid that then um, is part of the whole conspiratorial mindset. Now, it's this is one of the beginnings of the studies of conspiracy, but it has been um, criticized um, for, many, for many decades now, precisely for pathologizing conspiracy theories, for, for, for saying that, the, for basically, not even implying, but practically saying straight out that the people who believe in conspiracy theories are paranoid. It's shifted a little bit to a paranoid style. Um, and so one of the big things that people talk about in terms of conspiracy theory is whether or not you can use the term paranoid. Um, and I wanna shift it a bit further, not a conspiratorial style, but a conspiratorial stance, or to think of conspiracy as a mode like irony. It's something that you can engage in, but that does not necessarily have to define you. Um, and in so doing, we don't really have to coordinate all off from paranoia. Um, because we're not diagnosing something, we are um, making it possible to think of, of, of um, a conspiratorial stance or a paranoid stance as simply um, a mode like irony that we engage in and that maybe we don't um, maintain all the time. 
Maybe also there are smaller units of conspiracy. So um, rather than looking just at the super conspiracy, it might be worth thinking of um, what we might consider as the memes of conspiracy um, or the basic units of conspiracy, things like black helicopters, globalists, new world order, the Bilderberg group, which I always wanna call the Bilderberg group. Um, these little, these um, little uh, tidbits of conspiracy theory that migrate around, recombine with each other, and that when we invoke them, we, whether we'd like to or not, may be becoming closer to being um, subjects of conspiracy theories. Um, we're conspiracy believers for the moment that we utter a conspiratorial utter utterance, but we don't have to be conspiracy believers in the next moment. Um, so it's a, it's a part-time thing, and, and this way we don't really have to start spending so much time trying to figure out what's in people's head if we recognize that we can momentarily be the subject of a, of a, of a conspiratorial idea and then move on. Now, all of that's on the audience side, as it were, but what about the producers? Do the people really believe what they're saying on, on television? Does um, the... Uh, worst Voldemort of Russian state television, Vladimir Solovyov, really believe what he's saying? Does Tucker Carlson really believe what he's saying? Um, I would argue that politically, this is an important question, but in other ways, it's irrelevant. It's not, or not entirely relevant because sincerity is not what this is about. Um, so judging their sincerity is our external judgment of an internal state of mind. What we have instead is what they say and our reactions to what they say. At the moment that they make a conspiratorial utterance, they are at least momentarily conspiracy theorists. The self that exists momentarily to be the speaker of the statement is a conspiracist. That the next moment, that self might be something different. So that's the whole, the, the theoretical background. Obviously, I'm supposed to be talking about Russia. Um, so let me turn to Russia here. Um, because one of the attractions to studying um, conspiracy theory in Russia um, is that you can look at Russia as um, the, as the birthplace or one of the birthplaces of the modern conspiracy theory, um, largely thanks to the protocols of the meetings of the learned elders of Zion, um, which has a pedigree I'm sure many of you are familiar with that is kind of um, wonderfully bad um, in that it's an imported, um, it's basically a forgery based on a bad French novel rewritten to be about, um, to be written to be the minutes of um, the secret of uh, the meetings of the secret organization of Jews that run the world. Um, and it's so it's it's written in the language of really bad ideological prose, like Ayn Rand level bad. Um, so I want to give you a quote to give you a sense of what's going on in this book. The people under our guidance have annihilated the aristocracy who were once who were once their one and only defense and foster mother for the sake of their own advantage, which is inseparably bound up with the well-being of the people. So this is writing that doesn't trust its audience to know exactly what they're supposed to think. So the evil people not only are just revealing their evil plans, but they're also encoding what, sh what good people should be thinking and that what they are opposing. Um, and this is actually not an uncommon feature of some really kind of basic um, conspiratorial prose because it's also Manichae and also black and white. The protocols, again, which are an obvious forgery, um, have still um, are alive to this day. Um, but for my purposes, what's important is not the fact that people around the world still believe in the protocols, which of course on its own is hugely important and hugely problematic, but that the protocols help establish a, par a pattern of um, conspiratorial narratives. That is um, a bunch of people, usually men, um, meeting somewhere in secret, discussing either their plans or um, their operations for how they are running the world. So. Um, this sets up the notion of this cabal that you have to fight. Um, what becomes interesting there from the point of view of post-protocol stories is um, unless you're a hardcore um, anti-Semite, you might find some problems with the protocols of the elders of Zion, but it's very easy to use the exact same structure and just take the Jews out. Like what if the elders are not identified as Jews, they're just a bunch of evil people. And this is the sort of thing that actually happens a lot. Um, sometimes fairly deliberately in, um, in uh, popular fiction, especially thrillers. Um, so there's a series of really trashy thrillers called Mad Dog in the 1990s that I, fought, that I, um, that I look at. And at one point, all of a sudden, we have, we have this conspiratorial group um, who are never named Jews. And then after the bombing of Yugoslavia, when basically all bets are off, the author just calls them Jews. Um, but the, at some point, you have to ask yourself if the structure is just like the um, protocols, if you have a shadowy group of people who are 
written to be like the evil Jews from the protocols and might look like the evil Jews from the protocols, may they just as well be Jews. And this is important in part because of how useful the structure, simply the structure of a cabal of evil people is for thrillers. Um, they're a great kind of enemy. Um, but the question that I think remains largely an open question is how much ideological content you end up importing along with this structure that comes from this, uh, this um, quasi-fascist anti-Semitic um, conspiratorial tract. Um, so, look, so, okay, great. We have Russia to thank for the protocols, um, but there's more going on here that I think is actually um, of interest here. There are a lot of reasons why conspiracy theories would take hold in the, in the Soviet Union. Um, and those reasons are not always the same as the reasons that conspiracy theory took hold in the West. Um, in the Soviet Union, if we're talking about um, in particular the, the post-Stalin period, um, this has to do with, um, in a sense, the informational ecosystem, how information is, is circulated, what information gets out, um, who is the source of information. And the funny thing about the Soviet Union here well, is that even though um, it is ostensibly socialist moving towards, communis co towards communism, the from a point of view of information theory, the Soviet Union was mercantilist. The Soviet Union looked at, at information like, like a dragon looking at a hoard of gold that was just going to hold on to and not let out or just parcel out in small bits. Um, in the West, conspiracy theory sometimes arises um, out of the phenomenon of a sort of the markets relativizing of, of information, relativizing of theories. Like you have this idea, you have that idea. They all end up seeming kind of the same. What are you gonna choose? Oh, here's this shiny, um, conspiratorial idea, I can believe in that. Um, in the USSR, it's kind of the opposite. Relativizing everything that wasn't Soviet, put everything on a kind of equal footing and made it equally available. Um, but more to the point, the, the um, absence of reliable information, the, the awareness that the, the state was keeping information from you, um, distorting it, simply knowing that you're not hearing everything makes rumor take the place of fact. Um, rumor becomes really, really important. In the 80s with Glasnost, you would think that you have the answer to all of this. Okay, we're going to stop hoarding information the way we did. We're going to tell the truth. Telling the truth, one might naively think, would be the antidote to conspiratorial thinking. But it was the exact opposite um, under Glasnost, in part because of how Glasnost unfolded. It wasn't just that one day, um, uh, Gorbachev and the others declared, okay, we're going to tell you everything we've kept from you all this time. Here it is, we're all done. Instead, it was a process, dribs and drabs, like we're gonna tell you a little bit, we're gonna tell you a little bit more. And so two things happen. Um, one is you get the confirmation that the state has been withholding information from you all along. So it turned out to be true. Your conspiratorial theory turned out to be true. Um, and the process of slowly um, leaking information um, makes it quite reasonable to think, well, what else are they not telling me? So um, the result is there's, even as the state is trying to legitimize itself by revealing its past lies or its past omissions, um, it actually delegitimizes itself as a sor source of informational authority by confirming that it has always been unreliable. Um, um, that combined with all of the um, obvious things going on in the Soviet Union, that is its um, eventual collapse, um, the, the um, instability makes conspiracy theory really um, attractive. Now the collapse of the Soviet Union actually becomes um, a big part of um, subsequent conspiracy theories, um, in part because the conspiracy theories that existed before the collapse were already oriented towards the idea that, that enemies, usually in the West, sometimes Jews, um, are usually Americans, are trying to destroy the Soviet Union. One of the most famous, um, one of the most famous uh, theories was the Dulles Plan, which um, came from, which was actually a speech given in a movie based on a novel. It was supposed to be fiction, but then got repurposed as um, supposedly the truth about what uh, what America is trying to do to to the Soviet Union. Um, uh, here's a quote from from the Dulles Plan: "When the war ends, everything will work itself out, and we will throw throw everything we've got, everything we own, all the gold, all the material strength, on turning people into idiots. The human brain." People's consciousness are all capable of change. After we seed chaos in them, we will imperceptibly switch out their values for false ones um, and make them believe in false values. How, you ask? How? We'll find like-minded people, our allies and our helpers in Russia itself. This particular line of thought would only be christened the Dulles Plan in 1993, but it already provided a broad framework 
for understanding the, the Cold War in terms of conspiratorial melodrama, while still casting the relations between opposing sides in terms of symbolic exchange and in terms of um, trying to uh, use mass culture to um, affect the consciousness of the ordinary people. Um, so this, um, this fit in very well with uh, the Soviet Union's general reluctance to let in a great deal of Western mass culture because it was seen to be um, uh, corrupting and tempting and so on and so forth. And this legitimizes the idea that this all should be kept out because it's not just innocent fun. It's all there. Um, it's all part of this uh, dastardly plan to try to destroy our values. A lesser known, but still, um, um, still quite powerful um, conspiracy theory um, starting in the 70s um, called the Harvard Project um, was um, the brainchild of, of a man named Klimov, who was an emigre in the West, um, but who came up with this idea that basically um, there was a project in Harvard called the Harvard Project. It actually was an emigre study project, but it's turned into a brainwashing plan using um, the resources of powerfully um, intelligent and rich people at Harvard who are all Jews and all homosexuals, which are basically the same thing, according to Klimov, whose um, plot is to basically ruin Russian DNA in such a way as to turn Russians to, to gay Jews um, and then um, take over the Soviet Union and encode them with the number of the beast um, and work for the apocalypse. Um, and I have um, quotes, quotes up here from it, but I'm not going to go into it. Um, the great thing about the Harvard Project um, is how it mutates after the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Harvard Project was predicting a possible collapse. When the Soviet Union ends, it gets superseded by the Houston Project. Um, the Houston Project, which is, um, which, is an, uh, which basically says, all right, the West, we did it with the Soviet Union. Now we just have to get Russia. And it's all a plot to, um, to carry out what's called the Russian genocide, um, basically destroy most of, the Rus of Russia's population so that um, Westerners can come in and live in Russia as everybody wants to do. Um, all of this suggests something really interesting about, um, about Russian culture and conspiracy theory in the 90s, that it is both apocalyptic in that it's looking towards um, a horrible end and post-apocalyptic in that the horrible end, that is the collapse of the Soviet Union already happened at the same time. So it's this really fascinating temporality where you have the sense that the end of the world happened and now it's going to happen again, um, almost like a repetition compulsion. Um, combined with the um, Houston Project is this theory called the Golden Billion, um, which says that um, the that uh, climate change and other things are basically going to render most of the Earth uninhabitable. Um, the only part of the Earth that will be really a great place to live is Siberia, and that's why the West wants to take apart Russia so that uh, the Golden Billion, that is um, the only sustain the largest sustainable population on Earth, um, in this case of rich people, will move to Siberia, take it over, and find a great post-apocalyptic home. So, um, yeah. Um, what is behind all of this? What, what is it that makes these theories possibly credible? That is, what is it that makes it possible to believe that there are enemies out there who want to do this to Russia? Behind all of this um, is a very powerful ideological concept that we hear a lot about, which is Russophobia. Um, now, Russophobia, um, I would argue, when people talk about Russophobia, it's largely about Russia and the Russian state, Russia the country, um, more than it is about disliking individual Russian people. Um, it's hatred of the state, um, which is kind of perfect because, of course, um, the state is the hero of everything. Um, um, in the rhetoric of Putinism. Um, the idea of Russophobia goes back to the 19th century and Tsuchif, but it is um, revived in the 1980s by the, um, by the uh, dissident xenophobic um, uh, mathematician Igor Shafirievich, um, who argues that basically um, there are uh, male narode, lesser peoples within Russia, um, who are trying to um, hinder its progress, um, take over, and it's all code, of course, for the Jews. Um, there's a weird, it, it's a kind of, it's a moment of a clash between messianic visions, a, a presumed messianic vision for Jews and a messianic vision for Russians. It's kind of a chosen people enemy moment. Um, when when Shafarevich comes up with Russophobia, it's a powerful concept, but it isn't really that useful until the Soviet Union collapses, because then Russophobia can take the place of um, anti-Soviet agitation, anti-Soviet politics as an expl explanation for why people um, don't like Russia. 
The great thing about Russophobia um, is that if you believe that there's a Russophobic conspiracy out there, it really reinforces how important Russia is. That is, presumably, there is not a Luxembourgophobia out there of, of people around the world who are just con who hate Luxembourg so much because they're convinced Luxembourg is really, really powerful and going to take over the world. If anyone is from Luxembourg, I apologize, but I'm assuming that's really not part of, a, of the national myth here. Um, you know, there's lots of debates over whether or not Putinism has an ideology. Um, I tend to think the ideological question is, over, is um, overstated, that Putin's approach to ideology is largely ad hoc. It's kind of like the momentary subject of the conspiratorial utterance that I talked about before. He may quote the fascist philosopher Ilya Ilyin at one moment, but that doesn't mean that he's turning Ilyin's ideas into an actual substantive plank. There are only two things that are the, close to an ideology for, um, under Putinism, and that's strong statehood and, and sovereignty. Um, and all of this then gets backed up by the threat of Russophobia. Russophobia explains away all critique. It pro props up Russia's importance and the notion of hostility um, and um, is an incredibly useful tool for um, Russian media and Russian state apparatus. Um, it is used to disarm any possible criticism and to explain um, anything, um, any um, hostility from the outside. And um, at the end of the talk, I'm gonna explain how, um, how the West falls into a, a nice little trap with this. Um, so what is so what are these enemy forces that um, feel this Russophobia and um, and hate Russia so much? What is it all about? Um, more most recently, it tends to be about liberalism. Um, that liberalism is identified as one of the great external and internal enemies in Russia. Um, and by liberalism, you know, liberalism is a is a difficult term to uh, define because of all the different ways you can use it. You could be talking about say um, liberal economics like Thatcher Reagan. You could be talking about um, about um, social policies, and all of these are, imp are experienced in um, the Russian media uh, and in the Russian economy, perhaps in Russian politics at once in the 1990s, so it all gets kind of mushed together. Um, there is even a, um, a uh, term of abuse for, liber for liberalism called liberastia, that is liberalism plus pederasty. Um, all of this coming together in this kind of PC caricature of the, the horrors of the West where liberalism run, um, runs amok, like in this picture um, of tolerance. What school do you want our children to come to go to? And I love how it brings everything together here. You have the Jew um, writing on the chalkboard. You have the interracial gay male lovers. You have the dark skinned um, uh, boy ravishing the uh, white girl who has a satanic pentagram on her on her arm. Um, this is everything that um, Russia is supposedly not, oh, and, and her red panties are flying there, I never noticed that. Everything that Russia is not um, and everything that Russia must avoid. So for the past 20 years in building up this caricature of um, politically correct uh, correctness run amok in Europe and the United States, it's represented again and again as a clear and present danger to Russia itself as if Russia were on the verge of turning into Berkeley in just a couple of days. Um, it fits in really well with the um, third and fourth term, um, third and fourth uh, Putin term of Putin and the focus on family values and, um, and cons the conservative turn. Um, and this is when we get the demonization of the LGBT community. Um, because it's not as if, of course, that you know, before uh, 2011, um, the Russian public was in love with the LGBT community um, by any means, but for a good decade or so, um, the public expression of hostility towards homosexuality was not really all that marked, that it was not the big issue um, or not, not set up in the mainstream as um, something that you really needed to, to worry about. Um, and when, um, when the propaganda law comes in and people start to oppose it, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of people in Russia who hadn't really been thinking about um, LGBT issues are kind of puzzled that people are so upset about it, um, in part because of um, the persistence until quite recently of queer invisibility in Russia. Um, the Soviet Union really never invaded and never invented gaydar technology. Um, so chances are people in Russia might know someone who's gay, but they don't know that they know someone is gay. So um, people in the West going on and on about the rights of LGBT people to them might be just as irrelevant as, one, as worrying about the rights of leprechauns because they're just as imaginary to so many, um, to so many Russian people. Um, so instead what you have as the campaign against LGBT people is a campaign against not just a lifestyle, but against all sorts of 
attributes, liberal attributes that get um, folded into some, some um, evil LGBT agenda. Um, and there's all of this stuff about finding LGBT rainbows everywhere um, and trying to ban rainbows. Um, and it all plays into this notion connected to this um, idea of Russia as the um, home of family values that the West, in, um, both uh, Europe and the United States is getting so effete, so feminist, um, which is of course a bad word here, um, so, uh, um, so homosexual, so queer um, that um, everything is falling apart because no one knows their role anymore and there's no one to protect um, poor vulnerable women from the much more rugged masculine hordes coming in from, um, from uh, nations with darker skinned people, in particular Muslims. Um, this becomes allegorical. Um, at, in around 2013, I believe, there was a story in Germany about a young um, Russian migrant girl named Lisa, um, who, uh, no, Russian, I'm sorry, Russian, not migrant girl, a Russian um, uh, emigre girl named Lisa, who um, said she was raped by, um, by a dark-skinned uh, Muslim man, um, which becomes this huge story that they're pushing all the time on state television and watched in Germany. Um, constantly. It turns out to be all made up. That is, um, she ends up admitting that this never happened, um, but it fits really well in this narrative of a, of a weak feminized Europe that, um, cannot, that has no protection against these barbarian hordes um, and no protection against the, um, the sapping of good kind of uh, masculine energy that comes um, when, when um, the LGBT community is um, accepted. Um, at the time, in the um, and from around 2011 to 2014, the spokesperson for the evils of what is called gay Europa, that is gay Europe, um, was a woman named Irina Bergset, um, who was a Russian woman who married, um, uh, who married a uh, Norwegian man. Um, she had a child already, married a Norwegian man, moved to Norway, um, divorced him once she got, uh, an, once she was there long enough to get a residence permit, um, and then claims that her children were being taken away from her by, um, by, uh, ch by the uh, child protection services, all because she's Russian um, and that she and her child had, to, her other child had to flee back um, to, um, to Russia, the only place where they could live while her, her young child is being constantly molested by, um, by Norwegians who want to do nothing other than molest children. And she becomes a, uh, she's always on talk shows in the first year, first teen years. Um, she, here she is at the um, a, a March for the Protection of Children during the whole, um, uh, international adoption fiasco. And um, in this interview where she's um, sort of dressed like a matryoshka, um, she says, um, I'm a simple person, but I was stupid enough, dumb enough, I don't know the right word for it, to give birth to a child not in Russia, but in this terrifying land of Vikings, in this white Africa, where children are treated like merchandise. They dress my son in a Putin costume, and people line up to rape my four-year-old boy. And here I'm supposed to keep quiet and not go to demonstrations, because if I talk about it, they'll declare me insane, and I'll never see him again. And maybe I'll lose him, but I survive only by helping other people. As of today, dozens of children and families have fled from the West to Russia because they've seen my story, because they've heard my words, and people are learning what Norwegian and Finnish juvenile justice really are. The commentators on YouTube were, were merciless with, with comments like, I'm all a quiver. Where can I find a, a, a Putin costume? Or, hello, I've just moved to Norway and I want to rape a four-year-old boy. Can anyone tell me where I can buy a Putin costume? So she, there are lots of people laughing at this woman, um, but, um, but state television keeps bringing her on. Um, and she is part of, she's part of an entire um, range of people who argue that the entire problem in the West is the very idea of tolerance. That tolerance as a concept is alien to Russia. Um, it helps that the word used in Russian is an imported word, tolerantnost, rather than some native Russian word. Um, and that tolerance is, um, that the point of tolerance is in fact to um, destroy family values um, and make people no longer have any sort of morality. So um, there are two other topics that I talked about. I'm just going to mention them briefly because I know I'm running out of time um, that are all part of the whole conspiratorial um, ecosystem here. Um, one is this notion of zombification. Zombification is basically the Russian equivalent of brainwashing. It's just a different metaphor, um, but it means the same thing. The idea behind zombification, um, it posits basically that people are um, almost these passive receptors for inputs given to them by the media, by the state. Um, they will get these inputs and their minds will be changed um, and they will believe false things. And 
zombification comes up a lot. Um, um, it's come up a lot in the past 30 years, actually. But there's an intensification of the discussion of zombification um, once uh, um, once the conflict in Ukraine breaks out, and we have the little green men sent to, from Russia to Ukraine, and so on and so forth. Because you have this fascinating process where the Russian state Russian state television says Ukrainians um, in the West are um, against Russia because they're being brainwashed by Ukrainian television. Ukrainian television is saying that Russians um, in Russia are against Ukraine because they're being brainwashed by um, Russian television. The only thing everybody seems to agree with, agree upon, is that um, that zombification or brainwashing exists and that everybody is susceptible to it except them, right? Um, I'm not being brainwashed, but everybody else is being brainwashed. Um, and I think the most, if you, I have real trouble with the whole idea of brainwashing or zombification, but the most successful example of possible zombification that's going on um, in the post-Soviet space is zombifying or brainwashing people to believe in the phenomenon of zombification or brainwashing, and therefore to um, assume that other people's point of view are the product of um, naive, um, of the naive passive receipt of, of, of bad information, but my point of view is based on facts. This is something I think people could start to relate to, um, to um, in this part of the world as well. Um, this is all related to, in my final chapter, where I talk about the, the um, conspiracy and how it plays out in terms of the war in Ukraine, um, and that, um, which, which has to do with getting people, trying to get people to believe that um, in Ukraine, all this time, there have been all of these um, uh, fascist forces, um, the heirs of Bandera, just waiting to be awakened, kind of like Steve Rogers as Captain America, but here sort of as Captain Ukrainian Nazi, um, waiting to be activated, um, and that therefore that every that all the forces, the enemy forces in Ukraine are basically crypto Nazis, right? Um, and it, this goes back to the notion of, of conspiracy and melodrama, right? It's not just a conflict between two peoples or two states. It's a conflict between good and evil, a narrative pattern that is um, already familiar and legible um, and that allows you then to uh, bring events into this context without even having to really process them um, too much. There's a wonderful moment at one point when a few Russian soldiers um, who'd been briefly detained in Ukraine are asked um, are asked um, on doors, um, do you really believe that uh, the people you're fighting in Ukraine are fascists? And the answer is just great. He says, well, traditionally Russians have fought fascists. So if we're fighting them, I guess they must be fascists. Um, and so it all comes together in this kind of beautiful way. Now, um, I end with a, with, with a topic that I never thought I was going to, to really deal with, which is the, um, which is the convergence of, of um, conspiratorial world, worldviews in Russia and America. Because of course, as I was writing this book, um, I started writing it before um, I could possibly believe Donald Trump would be president. Um, and then I was um, sadly disabused of my, um, of my, um, my illusions. Um, and what was frustrating was um, watching all of the, um, I thought very, um, primitive comparisons of, of, uh, of Trump to Putin and the idea that Trump is trying to um, imitate Putin, all of which I think was, was kind of nonsense. But what is fascinating, the there are two things that are fascinating in the convergence. One is that intentionally or not, Trump and, and Fox News and all the others grope to the same tactic that the Russian state media has always used, which is if someone is against them, if they're protests, they're paid protests. If something bad happens on their watch, it's a false flag. Um, this is a common feature to both. Um, but what is really, I think, most insidious and, and not really the result of anyone's intent, it's a kind of anti-conspiratorial conspiratorial phenomenon, um, is that um, as, there was some, as there was evidence of Russian interference in American elections and um, perhaps ties to, um, to Trump, um, you end up with this moment in which the American left and some of the American mainstream is looking for Russian interference everywhere and starts actually quite openly expressing um, Russophobe, the sort of Russophobic positions that, um, that um, Putinism has been attributing to America for, for decades. That is, the result of all of this is that now we are actually as Russophobic as we had been portrayed as, even though I don't think we had been that Russophobic. And so, which is actually really great for Putinism. Putinism really thrives on the idea that um, that America and Europe hate Russia and are Russophobes. And if we start to act like it, it's, like, it's as if Russia had planned this. 
I'm not saying Russia did plan it. I don't think it did. Um, but the result is pretty much the same. So we're in this kind of bizarre conspiratorial feedback loop where our world ends up looking more and more like the result of the conspiracy, even if at times it's just, um, at times it seems to be um, a fair amount of, of happenstance, accident, and, and dumb luck. All right, that's what I wanted to say for today. Um, I will unshare the screen and I am happy to address any questions you might have. I'm trying to unshare the screen. There we go. Okay. All right. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, we have a couple of questions uh, that have come in. Um, so um, let's uh, start with uh, Russia was once very much excited to be integrated uh, into the Western world in the 90s, but now Russia and the West seem to be going back to confrontational status. What, in your opinion, has caused this change? Uh, is it because of actions that have been taken by Russia or actions taken by the West, such as NATO expansion or both? And what relationship do you see between these changes in policies and the evolution of conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theories? Great question. Um, my answer in terms of, um, of Russia's lack of enthusiasm for integration in the Western world post 90s is not at all original. Um, it's one that I think a lot of you will be very familiar with. Um, and in this case, I do put a lot of blame um, at the feet of the West um, in um, really uh, taking advantage of Russia's weakness in the 1990s, um, pushing for NATO expansion after what seemed to be credible, at least semi-promises not to do so um, in a way that's rather provocative. And of course, the big turning point um, was uh, America's, was uh, the bombing of, of, of um, Belgrade in 1999, which was seen as a, as a complete um, affront um, by uh, figures in Russia. Now, there are plenty of things also going on, on the Russian side, but where conspiracy theory comes in, I think, is that um, whatever was going on in Yugoslavia, and there's plenty going on in Yugoslavia, and there's plenty of um, problems with American and NATO, there's blame everywhere when it comes to um, the wars of Yugoslav succession. Um, one of the things that made the events in Yugoslavia so painful um, in the Russian media was um, the, I think, conspiratorial equation or equivalency between um, former Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union. That is, um, everything happening in, in Yugoslavia in particular, the West and America's actions in former Yugoslavia were being interpreted as a dressal for what the US or NATO wants to do to, to Russia next, right? So, um, so setting aside even the very um, strong um, conflict of interests um, between Russia and America when it came to ex-Yugoslavia, this particular framework makes everything worse. Um, and so once you have, um, much more open hostility and much more open disaffection um, with the United States than explaining what the US and what NATO is doing through um, conspiracy theory um, starts to make, uh, starts to be more appealing. Because you might ask yourself, well, why is the US doing this? Especially given, um, especially given that the coverage of the wars of Yugoslavia secession in the US and Russia, they looked like they were covering two completely opposite wars um, where, um, where on Russian state television, it was always um, the uh, blame-free Serbs being victimized by evil Croats and, and um, Muslims, and um, that was not what was being shown on, on, on Western TV. Uh, so to bring uh, the conversation into the um, current uh, days, um, what is your take on the political situation between the US and Russia today? Uh, and particularly if you could comment on the situation um, with Navalny. Uh, and if I might also add to that, um, all of the expulsions that are happening now um, in the diplomatic core, including uh, in countries in Eastern Europe. Well, I think both countries are kind of trapped in this, uh, in, in this, um, in this feedback loop that is very, very difficult to get out of. Um, so, I mean, there, I think there are plenty of reasons why um, the US and other Western powers would be critical of things, of some actions being taken by the Russian state, that's obvious. Um, but that criticism can play itself out um, in, in different ways. Um, if I were Joe Biden, which I would never ever have been, um, and I were asked that question, is Putin a killer? 
um, my response would be something along the lines like, this is a stupid question that I'm not going to answer because there's no answer to this question that I'm going to, that I could give that would be in, in any way constructive. Um, and when um, Biden says Putin is a killer, setting aside um, whatever we think of that factually, um, he's doing Putin a huge favor. Um, because it's reinforcing the idea that the West is against us. And so I think the trap for people in the West who want to try to have an influence on Russia um, is that right now it looks like the only influence that, um, that the US can have in Russia is to confirm, um, to confirm the Russian state media's narrative about how much we hate Russia. Um, so there's, there's very little room to, to have any, um, any action. As for Navalny, um, I certainly can't predict anything. I'm, I'm thrilled that he's eating again, um, but I don't see how I don't see how the U.S. at this point can have any can actually convince Putin um, or Putin's government to let Navalny go. Um, and I think we've lost any ability to have any kind of constructive um, effect on uh, on anything that Russia is doing. Uh, so our next question asks you to speak about some of the latter points that you made about Americans revived uh, Russophobia. Uh, in this context, what do you make of Trump followers who um, believed his positive feelings about Putin and by extension about Russia? That, that's a really fascinating moment because it sort of, it makes your head spin to see the American right wing go from, um, from its red baiting days of the Soviet Union and even afterwards um, to um, this infatuation with Putin and, and uh, with Putin, and I think that really has to do with not so much Russia itself or even necessarily Trump, but with what I would say are, are a lot of the impulses behind support for Trump, which is that kind of um, proto-fascist uh, admiration of the strong leader. Um, so, to the extent that Putin is um, is portrayed as this um, strong man who will uh, who will not take criticism, who will not stand down. Um, that fits in with how, how they wanted to see Trump, right? I mean, it's not really Trump at all, but the image that Trump wanted to have of himself. Um, and it also fits in with um, uh, a process that's been going on in the past decade or so in which um, what eventually became the alt-right, basically white supremacy, um, has really started to play up um, Putin and Russia as a kind of alternative um, white national ethno state, which of course, by the facts on the ground, really makes no sense. Um, it's it's in there. It's about the kind of um, global anti-globalist right um, that that um, looks at uh, at cognate figures to their own, like Orban and Putin, um, as 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 models. Um, but again, if there's plotting going on, I would say it's you know among the extreme right to get people to notice these figures and to approve of them but it's not but it's not a plot initiated by russia um you know russian trolls can play their role um but i think um our own country is doing a fine job um both um ruining our own politics and um really complicating our, our relationship with russia Um, another question has come in um, that asks you to uh, further reflect on this, um, uh, asking whether you think Russia's return to active measures is responsible in any way for the political divide in our society. I don't think it's responsible for the divide in our society. I think if there weren't a divide in our society, active measures wouldn't do very much. Um, so this is, so how you assess, the, the two, there are two problems of figuring out how to assess um, Russia's actions when it comes to hacking, active measures, whatever. One is whether or not you believe they're actually happening. Um, and to a large extent, I do, for what it's worth. Um, but two, um, the extent to which you want to um, really want to find an enemy that's somewhere else, right? Um, and um, the way I look at it is that I don't think, I don't think that in particular the Russian on, that Russian uh, trolls, Russian hackers, are, are that good, right? I mean, they can amplify messages. Um, for one thing, there's a, there can be an English problem. They can amplify messages. They can mess with things, absolutely. Um, they're very good at that. Um, but again, they're amplifying stuff that we already have. Um, I, I hold Facebook and Twitter much more responsible than I do Russia. 
Um, but it all comes together, right? And in Trump's, so Trump's election, you could blame Russia, you could blame Facebook, you could blame Twitter, you could blame Hillary for not campaigning in Wisconsin, any one of those things, if you changed it, we would have a different result. So what the result we have can look like the result of a really terrible conspiracy if you're not a Trumpist, but also can be the result of a whole bunch of contingent factors that happen together in this, um, in this unlikely, what I hope is an unlikely event, and here we are, right? So with answering these questions, ultimately really, the answer really, the answer one gives tends to come down to one's temperament, right? Um, do you look, if, you, if you're inclined to look for evil actors out there who are masterminding things, that's one thing. If you're inclined to believe that shit happens, that is another. Those are extremes, there, there are things along the way, um, but this is why I, I don't give Russia too much credit for our own mess. A comment and question came in from one of our master's students uh, thanking you for your intriguing presentation and saying that uh, if only this event had been in person, uh, there would have been some very animated facial expressions we all would have seen. <laughs> so that's what you have to say about COVID-related conspiracy theories, um, which seem to be more global in the sense that similar theories have gained a following in several different parts of the world, and whether you have seen a specifically Russian version of a COVID conspiracy emerge. Mm -hmm. So the COVID, COVID conspiracy theories are pretty international, right? Because for one thing, um, it's, I am always odd, A-W-E-D, odd by how, or what a truly global moment we are living in, to know that pretty much all around the world and to varying degrees, especially now if you look at say India on the one hand and Bhutan on the other, um, we have been experiencing this pandemic, which means of course people will be processing it. And then of course, thanks to the internet, these ideas about it are going to be spreading. There are certain basic things about COVID conspiracy theories that I think are going to be similar on their own. That is anti-vax anti theories um, have, often been based on just real anxiety about putting something in your body and who is putting something in your body. And I think that kind of anxiety can, can appear in multiple places um, spontaneously without having to be reinforced by an outside. It's kind of an obvious anxiety and it's a familiar anxiety. Um, but things like 5G and Bill Gates, um, those have to start somewhere and be spread. And that's an example, if you look at Russia and America, where um, you have an almost completely um, porous uh, boundary between the two internet cultures um, and you have really the same things going on there. Now, what I think is different is, and this is hard to judge again because of, of um, how, much me how, much you, how much media reporting is happening in each place, um, evidence seems to show that vaccine hesitancy um, in Russia is even greater than it is here. Um, and that, and so, a phenomenon like vaccine hesitancy, which often is connected to conspiracy theory, but not only about conspiracy theory, that I think can really vary um, depending on the rollout um, and general trust, right? And so there's a funny thing going on in Russia where on the one hand, polls at least seem to suggest that people believe a lot of what they see on state television, right? In a way that really kind of shocks people who, who were used to the idea that Soviets knew not to believe everything they saw on state television. So on the one hand, there's that level of belief. On the other hand, there's still a very familiar and old notion that, well, I don't really trust people that well. And when it comes down to them telling me about my health, I'm not really necessarily going to believe that. Um, and just in general, um, the decades of vaccine hesitancy and vaccine workarounds in the late Soviet Union where people would buy slips pretending to have vaccines and so on and so forth, and there was all sorts of talk about how vaccines are dangerous, um, makes it um, worse there. And then also the rollout of, um, of uh, Sputnik V. Sputnik turns out to be, apparently be this really effective, wonderful vaccine, um, which is fortunate because basically they used the entire country as stage three trials, um, phase three trials, and it worked. Um, but it could have not. Um, so um, I see plenty of reasons why there would be um, a lot more hesitancy over there. But when it comes to the actual conspiracies, they are pretty much the same. Um, and that general um, convergence of conspiracy theory around the world um, is definitely an internet phenomenon that really um, um, is quite powerful. So our next question brings us into the realm of popular culture. Uh -huh. um, and asks whether you think that conspiracy theories had um, any influence or uh, you know, even uh, any root 
in the screening of movies such as the Borat movie that recently uh, came out. Uh huh. Well, um, and then then you say such a naive question, which I think is an interesting follow up to it. Um, I'm reading the question myself. Um, I don't think it's a naive question, but I think it's it's an it it shows up an interesting problem here, which is that. Um, so when it comes to a movie like Borat, either the first or the second one, you can, on the one hand, believe, hey, there's this guy, Sasha Baron Cohen, who's really creative and funny, and created this character years ago that was on LEG for all this time, um, and came up with a movie, and this is really funny. And it's also not about Russia, by the way. Um, it's not really about Kazakhstan, because he has no idea what Kazakhstan is like. Um, fine. Um, and so that this is a contingent thing based on one person's talent and his luck and his connections and all that to get this stuff going. Or you can not believe in the possibility of one person independently coming up with an idea and actually being able to bring it to fruition and assume that there must be people behind it. And that last assumption is a really big part of the uh, Russian media ecosystem of the last 20 years. The question is always asked is who's behind him? Who's behind them? Who's come up with this? Um, and there's a general tendency to downplay the possibility that people independently have their own ideas and want to do something, go out to a protest, not because they're paid um, or, uh, or come up with some invention. I mean, the discussion, like all of the, um, the anxiety over uh, the internet and saying that it's a CIA project, right? And yes, the Defense Department funded the internet, no question. But at one point there's some, I think Putin, I think said something like, you know, do you really believe a couple guys in a garage like invented something? And the answer is, well, apparently they did, but it goes back to two competing myths, right? The myth in America, like everything is just some guy in a garage who can come up with something and be, because he's got these great ideas, it's gonna work and not about his privilege and not about systems. And then in Russia, the exact opposite, where it's never, it's rarely about one person individually doing something, um, it's, it's the system that then um, allows something to happen. So therefore, if Hollywood is letting a movie like Borat go out, it's not because Hollywood thinks they can make money about it. It's because the CIA is exerting pressure to have this thing screened. I find that very um, hard to believe, but that's because I'm, I don't have a conspiratorial um, mindset. Um, and I'm very distrustful of that, of, of that particular framing of the world. Uh, since you, um, you, know, you brought up the CIA and you were speaking earlier about um, Yugoslavia in the 1990s, and uh, certainly there, uh, you know, the word on the street was that, you know, any American was a suspect of being a member of the CIA. Right. Um, what, what do you make um, of, of, you know, very real news and stories that come to light as have in, in the past month or so of um, the activities of secret services um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and secret police, et cetera? And how does that then play into um, conspiracy theories, support them, uh, et cetera. And that is also related to one more question that came in, um, which was about the cap of the number of Russians that are allowed to work in unfriendly countries, embassies, but that was very much linked to um, the activities of, sort of the, the secret police coming to light. Uh -huh. So, but when you, what, do you have a specific example of, of secret police that you're talking about? Oh, sorry. So I, I just meant the like the um, more the, the more contemporary uh, period, like the activities of the, of, you know, the, the bombings that were happening in uh, Czechia um, and in Bulgaria oh, oh, oh. were happening oh, so around the, Europe, the most contemporary things. Oh, yeah. the, Rush, the Russian secret services. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I was thinking of the American secret services. No, um, no, sorry. I guess the way that I put the question was no, no, no. Um, I mean, it, talking more generally about, um, you know, how there are suspicions on you know, um, there are suspicions that feed conspiracy theories, but then as in the more recent case, there have been, uh, there's been evidence that's come to light of actual activities. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, I mean, that's the real challenge here, right? Is that um, sometimes the conspiracy theory is true and sometimes the paranoid story is also true, right? So um, the example I think of was when I was, I was in um, the Soviet Union when the Iran contract broke out that, um, and I, I was reading in a Soviet newspaper that Ronald Reagan was selling arms to Iran to fund the Contras against Nicaragua. And a friend of both laughed like, oh my God, they've really lost the plot here. This is insane. That's way too baroque. It happened to be what's happening, right? Um, and so the problem is that sometimes these stories are true. And then if the stories are true, how many others are true, right? And so you can take that to, the, to one extreme, which is, wow, it's all true. 
Um, another, what I try to do is remind myself that my anti-conspiratorial stance is naive in its own way, right? Because sometimes, sometimes the conspiracies are happening. Um, and what, in terms of the Russian secret services, this is not to pretend that American secret services don't do anything, but the extent to which you have evidence of, um, you know, um, the Russian uh, illegals program and, you know, polonium and um, Novichok and all of that and this, this recent the, the discussion of the, of the incident in the Czech Republic. Um, one, of the, one way you can look at it, which is not the obvious way, but and not the only way, is that, okay, let's say Russia is doing all of this stuff it's reasonable for people who are planning all of this stuff to assume that everybody else is doing it too, right? So um, if you act in a conspiratorial manner, you're probably assuming that the other side is doing the same thing. So um, it's a complete reinforcement of, of, um, of conspiratorial thinking on, on really every side. Um, but the real, it's a real epistemological problem here, right? So like um, when I was reading Masha Gessen's book um, on Putin years ago, where she talked, she has a, an extensive thing about the bombings um, the apartment bombings uh, that preceded Putin's election and makes a very convincing case for um, the Russian Secret Service being behind it. And I, I had this moment of kind of epistemological vertigo where I realized, okay, this sounds very convincing to me. I can also read another story of it that doesn't sound convincing and I have to make up my mind and I'm making up my mind kind of based on who I trust to begin with, right? Who I think is being a little bit paranoid, but when it comes right down to it, I have no direct access to any information about this at all, and I'm kind of making a decision um, based on um, based on things that aren't entirely rational and aren't based on on all the information, um, and that that makes it really hard to position yourself um, when it comes to a, to a a possibly credible conspiracy theory. So two questions have come in that are actually quite related. Um, okay. Is that one dominant Putin supported conspiracy theory is that the US slash CIA funds um, and supports uh, Russian opposition. Uh -huh. Do you think Putin himself believes this conspiracy or does he use this story purely for instrumental reasons? Does it uh -huh. work in Russian society? How would we know? And a, the similar question asks you to look at that dynamic in a more historical context um, and to comment on whether you see any continuities with Soviet era fears of enemies within and without. Um, and even, you know, does this notion of the Russian fifth column go back to the Spanish Civil War? Well, certainly the term does. Um, so yes, there, there are continuities, but I would say the problem with continuities is when you use the word continuity, it actually suggests something absolutely continuous. I would say somewhere between continuity and a revival. When you say this continuity, it sounds inevitable. Like there are all, of course, this is going to be persistent. But at some point, some people are making choices, right? Um, and I think that the, the Putinist government has made choices that um, uh, that go in the direction of conspiratorial thought and this idea of a fifth column. Now, does Putin believe this stuff? One, I have one impulse to give an answer about what I think about whether or not Putin believes this stuff. And then I remind myself, I am completely unqualified to read Putin's mind. Um, and the answer that I give does not have so much to do with Putin. It has to do with my own worldview, right? Um, and this is why I am, um, this is why I like the, the set of ideas I was proposing about a conspiratorial stance and an utterance um, in that it is possible that for um, the development of, of international relations and politics, it might be important whether or not Putin believes this, maybe. But I think um, for, most, for most of us, in terms of how we're reacting to the world, it's kind of irrelevant, right? Um, because if, if uh, the Putinist media is making these statements, they may as well be the statements of belief. Now, um, that doesn't mean belief can't change. That doesn't mean you can't retract what you said or just ignore what you said and say something different. My God, people do that all the time. Um, but when we focus on, um, on intent, I think it, on, on, on belief, I think it's really a distraction um, from what is going on because whether or not Putin believes this, um, the instrumental side of it is very, very real. Um, and um, given how improvisational Putinism has been, how much it has changed, um, how much, um, it, re how much um, it reacts to events and, and, and changes with them and how very practical it is at a lot of stages, right? You know, it's not about going in and conquering Ukraine. It's about setting up a very specific situation that's advantageous and going no further. Um, I would say that the, the instrumental um, is going to be much more important than the belief aspect. Um, 
Um, so we have a little more time, so I invite you to keep um, keep sending your questions in. Um, we had it looks like we've, we've hit on a, a very a topic of great interest here. We have one more question about the CIA, which says uh -huh. that if we are actually trying to cause chaos via riots. Um, why do you think that they're so bad at it, so to speak? Are they targeting the wrong age group? You know what what's happening there. The funny thing is the only thing that could make me really believe the CIA is behind it is it, if, it's, if it's not working very well. Um, because my bias is towards the, um, towards the uh, breakdown of systems um, and, how, and how hard it is actually to make things work. Um, and what I think one of the problems with a lot of the conspiratorial explanations for opposition and all of that is it imagines this all powerful CIA, all powerful American state um, that um, I, have seen, I have seen little evidence of the um, efficiency and brilliance of the American state. Um, so, so I am skeptical about that. So yeah, um, they would be doing a very bad job at, uh, at it. I, I'm willing to believe that you know, funds have been, that funds at various points have gone to support various activities. And, and in fact, openly in the 1990s, you know, we encouraged all these pro-democracy institutions. Um, all of these things that in the 1990s were, were seen as above board and good, like all of the stuff that Soros was doing, are now seen as evidence of, a, of an anti-Russian conspiracy. Um, but the problem is that either the reality of some participation or the um, fantasy of participation um, has one main uh, role, which is to discredit the very real feelings and beliefs of people who believe differently from what um, the state media is saying. Um, and this incredibly cynical um, disavowal of any possibility of someone on their own coming to a political conclusion that is different from what is um, being given in the media and that is not about um, what you can get paid for, um, that is really a problem, but that is also something that I think is so consistent with um, in general, post-Soviet attitudes towards politics, which are cynical to the core, right? And for good reason. Um, but if you can't believe in, if you can't believe in even the slightest possibility of um, altruism, of sincere belief that is not connected to the state or to being um, part of an, uh, an organized and approved religious group, um, then um, I think that's really, that's sad, right? Um, because, and that really um, is a problem for any, um, any uh, growth of, of long lasting civil society if you just assume that people who are out there trying to do good must have sinister ulterior motives. Um, and picking up on that last point that you made, and you know, this is um, a difficult and perhaps an unfair question, but you, know, you mentioned during your talk that uh, the truth and evidence are not necessarily very effective in combating conspiracy theories. So what then do you think is necessary? Um, what convergence of factors perhaps are necessary uh, to make conspiracy theories have less fertile ground in a society? Well, there are a few things and none of them are my original ideas, I should point out, because I, I don't have to deal with the real world and I don't have to offer solutions, um, which is good because I'm not good at it. Every prediction I've ever made has been wrong. Um, so um, having said that, I think we can already see that um, as problematic as this sounds, um, limiting access to certain platforms can make a difference. Um, I certainly know that my mental health has really improved since Trump went off Twitter, um, but also um, the absence of that loud voice on Twitter has, I think, made a difference for our politics. So um, really reevaluating what's going on in social media platforms um, is an important thing. But in terms of a person to person thing, the most convincing things that I've read, and again, this is not me coming up with this, um, is that it is a matter of not like trying to debunk or argue with someone that never, really just never works. People just retrench into their positions. Um, what I hear again and again is what you're supposed to do. Like, when, So you're at Thanksgiving and your, um, your QAnon uncle is going on and on about um, how Hillary Clinton is drinking the blood of children and all that. Um, the thing to do is not say, well, of course you're not drinking the blood of children. Are you crazy? Like, is to sort of go back. So what is it? So what is it that you, what do you think the real, uh, what are your real, worries about America, you know, what do you think is really going wrong here? Um, and try to make a connection based on the feelings and fears and concerns that are beneath the specific beliefs that you find crazy, um, which then allows you to humanize yourself with that person. And then maybe slowly along the way, get to the point where maybe you can um, get them to step away a little bit, being aware that they're probably trying to do the same thing to you. Um, the problem here with that is that this is 
um, this is one-to-one -one retail um, work that is a, about a long-term commitment that in most cases we are not in a position to do or have a desire to do. Um, but there, from what I can see, there's no quick fix. And it's a, it's a kind of, engage, of, a, of emotionally intelligent understanding engagement that I don't know if I would be capable of, of um, sustaining because I just want to scream at people. Um, but it seems, from what I've seen, it seems to be the most promising approach. Okay, well, we have come up on the end of our time. Um, so uh, on behalf of the center, thank you so much for such a thought-provoking and interesting uh, presentation and set of reflections. And uh, you know, hopefully in the near future, we can welcome you to campus as well. Um, but it was wonderful that you could join us today. So um, Elliot Bornstein, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This is a real pleasure. Okay. Right. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.